Um, my name is Susan Sons. I'm executive director of OmniSoc. So while I'm getting slides, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I usually think that that means people are engaged. I spend a lot of time with young children, and I know that they're interested when they can't hold it in. So uh, you do not have to hold comments to the end of the talk. I'm going to be talking a little bit about OmniSoc, which you've heard mentioned a few times so far today. Um, a little bit of what we do and what it's like to be one of our members, and also a section I kind of call Dish the Dirt, which is what are the things that we usually talk about with our members that you guys might not be hearing about? Um, okay, so that was the intro. Um, my email's on here if you want to get a hold of me. It'll be on the last slide as well. I'm going to jump in. Um, so these are our current Research SOC members. Um, you've heard me say OmniSOC. You've heard me say Research SOC. Research SOC is a project within OmniSOC that is specifically designed to support research facilities and research projects. So OmniSOC as a whole, besides all of our research SOC folks, have 11 higher ed institutions right now and two regional research and education networks. Um, but I'm going to be talking about Research SOC. I use Research SOC and OmniSOC interchangeably sometimes. Um, we're the same people, the same technical infrastructure, but we have different programs because we know that a large university and a small university and an NSF major facility are not all the same things. Um, our current Research SOC members are NRAO Engage, who you heard from earlier, Noir Lab, National Solar Observatory, Academic Research Fleet, and ACCESS, which is the successor to EXCEED, for those of you who aren't familiar with it yet, um, is in the process of setting up their onboarding. And we hope to grow that list. Um, so what the heck are we? I'm going to skip sort of the sales pitchy stuff and just tell you what we've been doing with NSF facilities. And the main thing is we're always watching. It's expensive and difficult to set up 365 you know, 24-7, 365 monitoring, to always have someone with their eyes on the glass, to always have trained human judgment present. We're able to do this for a lot of facilities because we've built it all into one SOC. Um, something else that sets us apart is we have project liaisons. Um, a couple of them are in this room. Um, these are people who provide a human touch because if you signed up for one of my commercial counterparts like FireEye or something, they're gonna send you a lot of alerts. As a matter of fact, they're going to send you hundreds of alerts every single day and they will have been spit out by their various technical systems. And now you have hundreds of alerts and who are you going to pay to go through all the alerts and understand what they mean? And how are you going to tell, well, this thing's highly rated, but man, that seems like a confidentiality thing. And I share my data, I'm open science, but does it mess with my data integrity? How do I know what it means in the context of science? And that's why we have people like project liaisons. These are folks who go through and tell you, okay, out of your vulnerability report, you need to pay attention to these five things. Or, hey, this alert came up. This one is a when you get around to it, whenever your once a month patch cycle is your once a week patch cycle, but this thing you need to care about right now. It adds that human touch explanation and analysis so you're not just dealing with a fire hose of stuff. Um, as a matter of fact, instead of hundreds of alerts a day, our average major facility hears from us about once a week to twice a month. Um, not that we're not talking to them when we don't have an alert from them, but we are researching and filtering alerts ourselves. So we're only telling the facilities about things they need to care about. Um, we have a lot of what we kind of call our SOC plus things. Um, not every major facility is at a point where they can provide themselves with vulnerability scanning and honeypots and tabletop exercises. So we offer all of that. Um, and of course, others have alluded to the virtual cybersecurity services. That's basically skilled people we can plug into your organization. Um, and I won't belabor it because everybody's interested in all the other parts of the talk, not this. So what the heck happens when an incident happens? Um, this is usually the first thing people ask, even though this is not the first thing we hope to do with a new member. Um, but SOCs are really about detection. Um, so when we have a detection, before we even tell you anything happened, because again, hundreds of these per day at least, um, we are doing research and assessment on our end. We're going through, we're saying, does this really mean anything for this facility? Is this a false positive? Is it an indicator that really isn't enough on its own to take action? Or is this something where I want a security engineer to start diving deep and doing some threat hunting to understand what's really going on here? 
when we decide that something is really going on here, um, we're gonna put in a ticket with whatever system the member has. And then we're gonna talk to them on Slack if it's during the business day. If it's not during the business day, each of our members has told us, these are the conditions under which I want you to wake me up in the middle of the night and how you do it. Um, and that's really nice because everybody's tolerance for this stuff is different. One facility may say, no, this is our on-call number. It'll go to whoever's supposed to be on call tonight. We always have somebody ready to respond. Another facility may say, nobody here gets paid for on-call. So unless my entire network's about to get ransomware, just don't call me, I'll deal with it Monday. If it is about to get ransomware though, here's my cell number. Here's my number at my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> here's where my kids go to school. Here's all the places you can track me down. It, it really varies. And that's one of the things is, um, as I'll talk about later, we believe in meeting facilities where they are. Um, and then it's a collaborative investigation. We're not just throwing alerts at a facility and asking them to deal with it. We're working with them and helping them investigate. There are always things at a facility that your IT staff are better poised to investigate than we are, but they need to be backed up by the people with the network data. They need to be packed backed up by the people with threat intelligence and monitoring feeds and the ability to crunch a lot of data. So this is a partnership. Um, something you should know is by the time we get down the road, we've started doing this collaborative investigation and now we've figured out here's a problem and here's what it looks like. So now we scan across all the members to see if we can see other instances of the same problem. This means, and I'm gonna pick on random members, sorry guys, if Gage, sees a new attack and they're having a problem when we're working with them to remediate it, we're now going to scan everybody and go, oh my goodness, this is present in the academic research fleet. We need to shut this down before it can have the effect we had at Gage. And that's really helpful because we're always creating new threat intelligence that is very specific to research in higher ed because that's the only people we work with. That's what our target is. Um, we also partner with Trusted CI. If you haven't noticed, there's a close relationship here. And that's because it gives us a chance to help NSF facilities beyond our own membership. If you are not an OmniSoc member, you can still subscribe to the threat intelligence feed from Trusted CI. This is a mailing list. It's pretty easy to take in. When we find something that's new or different or has a particular impact for NSF major facilities, mid-scale or the long tail of science, we tell them and they publish an alert on it for our whole community um, with as much information as they're able to share. And that can be really helpful if you're not in a position to be an OmniSoc member um, or if you're still working on getting there, you can still get this threat intelligence that we've helped create because we're not a company. I'm part of Indiana University. Um, that's where we hang out. We don't get to turn a profit. Um, we're here to help the community as much as we can because we wanna support good science being done. Um, some of our members have decided to subscribe to what we call Red Phone, which is incident response support. So someday you're going to have a really bad incident. I don't know if it's today. I don't know if it's tomorrow. I don't know if it's five years from now. Just about every organization has one at some point. And I'm going to bet none of you can afford to keep a full-time forensic specialist on because we don't use them at major facilities very much. And I'm also going to bet that your security team is fairly small. Um, if you have a bad incident, what you want is all hands on deck and you want access to specialties that you can't employ full time. And that's something that we do. It's part of a membership you can buy. And when one of our red phone customers calls and says, hey, I have this horrible incident, my forensics guy is showing up and he's going to be able to help us look at systems that have been infected, find out what the problem is, find out the in indicators of compromise so that we can trace this down. We're going to have network specialists who are working with the core OmniSoc analysts and engineers so that we are track, we're figuring out where could this have moved in your network and what do we need to do to ensure that it doesn't. Um, we have people who can help you communicate with your leadership. Um, we have people who are very well versed in not just all the major operating systems you might have on your network, but some of the specialty things that only really exist in the NSF world. And we can bring all those people to bear. Um, things eventually get resolved. And we're going to reassess that process and make technology improvements every time. I don't think we've ever worked with someone on an incident where we didn't learn something either about how we relate to that particular member 
or a new technology or a new technique or a process improvement we ought to implement. Um, and then we go fold those lessons learned into our future operations. So I keep talking about community. I keep talking about members. Why the heck does this matter? Um, there are a lot of security silos out there. You could build your own SOC. It'll be expensive, but you can do it. And there are always trade-offs, right? Um, some of the things that you gain by not making a silo, reducing costs. Um, obviously, there's a lot of overhead to setting up a SOC. Understanding threats in our vertical, this is a big thing that I'll talk about more later, but we are generating threat intelligence because we don't just work with all of industry or all of government or something like that. We're looking at major facilities and we're saying, what's hitting major facilities right now? What's being successful and what's not being successful? What can we do about it? Evolving with cyber infrastructure, we're very cyber infrastructure focused. That's why we're here. Um, we want to meet everyone where they are because most cyber infrastructure is immature from a cybersecurity standpoint at this point, and helping them iterate over time instead of selling you a magic box, which claims that it's going to fix all your problems and magic boxes don't really work that way. Um, another big thing is career paths for SMEs. I am yet to see a junior security analyst get promoted to astrophysicist. Um, which means that it can be hard to hire at a major facility because you hire in an analyst and they're going, so where's my career path coming from? Because they know they're not gonna become an astrophysicist. That's not what they're trained for and that's not what they've been working on and learning. So one of the things that we do is we have a good career path for our folks here at Research SOC. Um, we give them a place to say, okay, you can even get some variety. Maybe you're working with academic research fleet and then we send you to work with a telescope. This keeps smart people engaged and it lets us keep them longer. Even in the age of the great resignation, we've done a pretty good job. Um, and also learning together because we've got this community of NSF science, we really try to take things that we've learned in one place and turn it into an improvement that everyone can benefit from. Um, Bringing in new facilities, this is onboarding to OmniSoc. I wanted to give you guys a picture of what it's like to be or become a member. Um, but I'm gonna go through this quickly because I'm hoping people will have interesting questions for me. Um, we do all of the unfun contracts and money and which things do you actually wanna do with your facility. Um, once we get that done, we dive into deeper discovery. This is mostly around technological things. This is mostly about what assets are most important, where do we want to deploy an endpoint agent, things like that. But you'll also see things like understanding your communications channel. Who do we wake up in an emergency? What do we do if we can't get that person on the phone? Um, what kind of things do you need to be able to tell your leadership so they can understand your cybersecurity posture and how do we help you put that together? Um, there's a couple of phases of onboarding. This is setting up monitoring appliances and aggregators and all that tech work so we can suck in your data and do something useful with it and make sure we can we communicate things you want to know. And then you get to move to production. So life in production, aka member ops, a lot of different things are going on. And this is sort of the big overview, which ends up... Um, this is the stuff that my CIOs are going and telling their boss, look, this is the stuff we're gonna get. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of hidden operations when I get to my ditch, dish the dirt section. Um, but we have a quarterly leadership meeting. This is a leadership representative, usually a CISO or a CIO from each facility. We get together about once a quarter and we talk about what is changing in our facilities. What are our big concerns? What's going on here? What can we learn from one another? What did we improve? What failed so that nobody does it that way again? Um, Bi-weekly ops meetings, some facilities have, offer, have decided to do this more or less frequently, but this sits down with your IT folks and our OmniSoc folks and says, okay, what do we need to change? What do we wanna look for? What new assets are coming in and how do we get ready for them? What changes are coming up? We do a lot of quick back and forth via Slack. I talked about project liaisons. We're working on improving our reporting and dashboards, but we're already doing regular vulnerability reports and some other sort of, I call it static reporting because we send you a report document instead of having fancy dashboards you can manipulate, but we're working on the fancy dashboards. 
Shadow sessions are a big thing. You can get your IT or cybersecurity folks to sit with our threat hunters and learn how we hunt on your data. We're not looking to make you dependent and lock you in. We wanna teach you and help improve your organization. So you can sit here and watch what do the experts do when they're trying to find a threat on your network? What's important? What's hard to read? What data isn't very useful and could be more useful? Um, VCS ops, that's folks like Ryan here and Adrian and Mike who lead or are part of security teams that are embedded at our major facilities. Um, some of our facilities have looked at trying to hire full timers and provide career progression and all these things and said, you know what, why don't we have the specialists at Research SOC do it and then we can focus on doing the science and that's worked out very well. Um, and a big part of this is continuous improvement, something I'm going to be repeating ad nauseum throughout this talk, because I don't want folks to ever think that cybersecurity is really done. That's a lot like asking people, well, when is the science going to be done? When is it over, guys? When, when have we discovered all the things? There's no discovered all the things. So the part you've all been waiting for. Um, these are some things we've learned about doing cybersecurity with NSF facilities. And the first is walk, then run. Um, I cannot count the number of times someone from a research project at any scale has come to me and said, can we buy a pen test from you? And I've looked at them and I'm set up a meeting and we've gone over their infrastructure. And I'm like, well, I can pen test you, but your instrument's gonna be down for anywhere from a week to 90 days because you are not mature enough that I can pen test you without causing damage. But pen testing is the thing their boss has heard of, so they wanna start there and they haven't gotten any of the earlier in the process security things done yet. And pen testing can be very dangerous. Um, so we really nudge all of our members to start with fundamentals and work their ways up because that lets us actually secure things in a way that isn't causing us to become a liability because we wanna support the science. We don't wanna stop everyone from doing it because we took a ship out of the water or we shut down a telescope. OT is special IT. For those of you not familiar with these terms, IT, you probably know information technology. OT is what we call operational technology. This is sort of the buzzword of the year. You may be more familiar with control systems or ICS and SCADA. Um, OT is all of the things that are computers or network attached devices that in some way are part of the physical world. This is the thing that points your dish. This is the thing that steers your ship. This is the thing that points your telescope or opens and closes the dome. Um, these are all over the place. They're even in your fire suppression systems in your buildings. There's a lot of this stuff. And this is a place where I see a lot of facilities tripping up because about twice a year, I have to talk to somebody who said, I went and I found industry benchmarks of cybersecurity. And it says that it should be this percent of our IT budget. And why are we spending more than that? But what they've done is their IT budget is exclusive of anything considered a scientific instrument. What they're not telling you about is the millions of dollars in drones and telescopes and controlled telescope buildings that can move and all of these other things that they're taking care of. And they haven't considered that part of their IT world. I've even run into major facilities, I'm sad to say, where the people who run their OT refuse to talk to the security people because we're not IT, we don't need cybersecurity. And you can't even get them on the phone. Um, this is sort of, a, a, I, I call it the social disease of NSF science, cybersecurity, because they probably got that idea from someone they knew. It seemed really reasonable, and yet it's going to get them in trouble. Because let me tell you, if your financial systems and all of the scientists' email are totally secure, but I take out your telescope, you're having a really bad day. Um, there's also health and safety effects. Um, one of the things I remember visiting the Gemini telescope years ago, and one of the first things we figured out looking at their OT was, hmm, if I get a hold of this control system, I can smash a person between the telescope and the building and kill them. Um, and that's not a good thing to find out. Luckily, that's a facility where their OT people were really receptive to learning about cybersecurity. So we were able to make progress with them so that they don't have to think about that being a major threat in the future. Um, 
But if I wanted everyone to learn only one thing from my presentation, it's this. Your OT is special IT. It does need cybersecurity protection. Um, blinky box obsession. This is a minor social disease. Um, this is the thing where your boss is really excited to give you money for a fancy security appliance or a software as a service, but they won't give you any people to operate it. So you have a blinky box either in your corner or the corner of a cloud provider, but nobody's watching it. So you think you have monitoring, but you don't. Someone has checked a box, but this isn't working for you. Um, this is also something we're working on. Security technology can be really effective in reducing the amount of subject matter expertise that you need and the amount of staff you need, but it doesn't replace staff. I don't have a blinky box that is as smart as one of the analysts I have in this room. Measurement is hard. This is a fact of life. It's not just NSF facilities, um, but all of our bosses want to know what they got for their money and what they got for all of the effort that we've put into cybersecurity. And measuring what didn't happen is really hard. Um, does an apple a day really keep the doctor away? Well, people have been trying to answer that question for years, first with uh, direct studies, then with meta-analyses of other data sets, and they're still arguing about the value of apples. Um, cybersecurity is about the same way. I can't tell you how many times you would have gotten attacked if you didn't have OmniSoc. I can tell you how many things we detected and stopped, but are those the same number? I don't know. Um, we're always iterating and trying to improve the ways that we measure cybersecurity ops. Um, but this is going to be a hard problem for a long time, especially because most of the industry standards for measuring come from industry and they want to measure it in terms of dollars. I cannot directly translate $50,000 in a corporate setting to X amount of science. How do I measure how many sciences you did this month? I don't really know. Um, so this is a problem we're working on, but it's going to be a long iteration. Um, funding challenges. Um, security is an unfunded mandate. I've definitely seen NSF projects that say we're going to do great security and they don't fund anyone's time or they give security 25% of an IT person who doesn't know anything about security and is trying desperately to catch up. Um, that happens a lot, unfortunately. There's also what I call the stone soup problem. It's one of the effects of bolt-on security. Um, bolt-on security is what happens when a thing is designed without any security people being involved, and it's designed in a way that is very difficult to secure. And then we try to add security on top of it, but it's difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. Stone soup can be a lot like that. It's when an organization tries to do an infosec or cybersecurity process or enter a control, but their infrastructure doesn't actually support it. For example, um, we worked with a facility not long ago that wanted to jump in and, okay, we're joining OmniSoc, this is gonna be great. Um, we're gonna have all of this monitoring, we're gonna be better, we're gonna have 24 seven, it'll be wonderful. And then we found out that they did not have possession of a device on their network that could provide network monitoring feeds to us. We worked it out, we sent them one, we helped them install it, we worked from that point forward, but this is something we run into a lot where the actual IT infrastructure, either because of age or lack of security people involved in the design, is not set up in a way that we can get what we need, so we're trying to make something from nothing. Susan, I'm gonna have to give you a one minute warning. Oh no, okay, well I'm gonna skip forward. We all know we have funding challenges. This is cheap wins. I never like to tell people about problems without solutions. So these are all things that are cheap to do. I don't promise they're easy, but they can make your cybersecurity better. Number one is get your program officer engaged if you can at all. I see a lot of facilities where I say, okay, do this thing. And they said, but my PA says they don't, we don't know if NSF will let us do that thing or if it's okay. So they canceled it. They won't even look at it. And then I have one facility and I'm going to praise ARF here because you're awesome. Um, their program officer, Jim Hollick, is on a meeting with their cyber infrastructure team at least twice a month. And if they say, we don't know if Jim, if NSF will let us do this, but we'll have Jim next week, we'll ask Jim. And now we don't have that inhibition about getting things done. And it's been amazing. The next one is start during the facility planning phases, whether you're planning to revamp or improve your facility in some way, or whether you're planning a new facility, get a security SME in there as early as you can. 
Um, I can even give you 10% of an expert. You don't have to hire somebody full-time and figure out how to source that. But let somebody tell you, if you do it this way, it's Swiss cheese. And if you do it this way, it's really secure because doing it right from the beginning will save you lots of money and frustration. Um, security advocates on IT and OT teams, if somebody on each one of those teams is paying attention and talking to your security people, things get better. And that's a very cheap thing to do. Um, trusted CI resources, uh, I'm not gonna belabor them because I think other trusted CI folks have done a really good job, but NSF gives trusted CI money. They're not coming out of your budget. Take advantage of it. Um, OmniSoc and trusted CI webinars, we do a lot of things to provide free education. Um, NSF Cybersecurity Summit is coming up in October. That is extremely cheap to attend and it's a place that whether it's leadership, IT leadership, or some of your tech folks can learn things about cybersecurity specific to this community. Um, CIS controls, use version eight because it tells you useful things about OT, you don't have to figure it out. Um, Research SOC does security operations assessments that can tell you how ready you are for SOC monitoring and other um, security controls that you're going to need to get to at some point. Um, we have advisory services, we're happy to help and we will, you don't have to become a 24 seven, 365 monitoring customer, member, full member, all the data, all the everything to jump in on that. Um, yeah, and I'm going to stick to questions because I'm pretty much out of time here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, sorry to rush you, Susan. Yeah, I think there's 11 minutes before the buses depart. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that's what we're up against. Um, uh, so um, if uh, so, I think maybe if you have a question for Susan, um, come on up and talk with her directly. But otherwise, um, I'll just say thanks, everyone, for your participation. Thanks very much for uh, support from the AV team and from the uh, the meeting organizers this week and from NSF. Um, but let's uh, let's thank Susan for her presentation. <laughs>